Welcome to Building with Brick, Foundational Wisdom on Coaching, Careers, and Christ. This leadership podcast was spawned by Coach Brickner's book, So You Want to Be a Coach, which is the story of a corporate executive who made a drastic career change and became a head men's basketball coach. Dr. Brickner's book is available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook on Amazon.com or go to his website, www.drjoebrickner.com. That's D R J O E Brickner.com. While you're at it, check out Dr. Brickner's new book, America Lost in Place. You can get it in paperback, hardback, ebook, or audiobook on Amazon.com or just go to Dr. Brickner's website. Now, here's this week's podcast. Welcome back to Building with Brick. My guest today, Chuck Smirt. Chuck is a is the founder and the president of the Compliance Group, a group that's a consultant for NCAA. It's represented a huge number of institutions over the years. He's in his 23rd year as a consultant. In our first session, we talked about the transfer portal. A lot of very interesting things that uh, that I didn't know that Chuck shared with us. This session, we want to talk about the name, image, and likeness. And to me, that's basically a way that you can pay your players to play for you. But my understanding of this, and I don't want you to really get into to the rules on this, Chuck, but my understanding is the institution can't pay the kid, but anybody else can. And it's, they're not paying them to play, but they're paying for their use of their name, their image, or their likeness, however they want to use that. And, and that's my understanding of it. So why don't you share with us the real story? Sure. Many people believe the sky is falling in intercollegiate athletics. And I don't know if I would agree with that, but there, it, this is a pretty seismic change in everything. If you think about, if you think about the legislation, the uh, collegiate legislation, NCAA legislation, there's the benefit area, if you will, there's the recruiting area, there's the cert- eligibility area, and then, the, and then maybe the financial aid area. So the whole concept of amateurism was over all of these areas. Now, with name, image, and likeness, amateurism has been blown up. So mm-hmm. you, have, you have some now antiquated legislation, and you have this name, image, and likeness, where you, can, you can't get paid for, if, if an athlete goes out and scores 30 points a night for five games, he can't get thirty thousand for you know a hundred uh, or a thousand a thousand a point. He can't get thirty thousand for that, but his reputation just increased, so he can get money for those games in the sense of his reputation has increased. So you can get paid for play, but you can get paid for a reputation, and so now with. You can, this amateurism principle within the NCAA is diminishing. The problem is there's there's residual legislation that's still out there that conflicts or doesn't make sense. So, for example, uh, if a booster owns a Wendy's restaurant and he pays all of his other employees $20 an hour for working a counter, if an athlete would go there and work the counter, he has to pay him $20 an hour because that's what everybody gets else gets for that job. But he can do a side deal with that athlete to have him come in and sign autographs and give him $10,000. Well, it, it makes no sense. So you have all of this 
fallout from a very significant change in one area of your legislation that is going to have significant effects throughout. Athletes couldn't get couldn't couldn't work camps and get paid more than anybody else because of their stud athlete. Well, now you can. So oh. it's a it's a a very significant change to the amateurism principle. The amateurism concept in intercollegiate athletics is diminishing. It's it's it is crumbling. And it's and the other another, I guess a side fallout is besides amateurism, the belief was everybody should be treated equally. All athletes should be treated equally. That's not happening now because mm -hmm. if i'm a if i'm a a wrestler my name image and likeness deals are significantly less if i'm a, than i than a men's basketball athlete and i'll you know it varies from school to school but let's say let's say at a at a power five school they have they have Power five school have five, 600 athletes. Let's say at that school, they only have 200 athletes who have NIL deals. That's basically football, men's and women's basketball, some volleyball. That's it. Those other athletes aren't going to be getting that um, anything. So it's impacting revenue sports. And it's impacting, um, you know, a lot of it's men's sports. Chuck, who's the contract with? I mean, the institution can't say, okay, we're going to sign a contract for NIL. And is, is it anybody, any booster, any friend, a relative? It Who can, can be, think about it as there's two different buckets primarily. One is individual deals, where if I'm the quarterback, I'm going to go to um, maybe the local hamburger place wants me to do to do different things to promote their product, to put them on Twitter. That I would say something every week about the local hamburger joint. Just came back from from Sam's Burgers. You know what a great place. Okay, well that. He just picked up a thousand dollars for doing that or something. So you have the individual deals, and then you have the organization deals, which are more of the collectives that we that I'll, that I'll focus on in a minute. But that this this collective or this this uh, organizational deal could be uh, with the whole team, for example, and that people can donate to that, that organization, and then that organization will subcontract with other organizations where athletes will, will go out and promote them. So it, a school can't do an NIL deal with an athlete. When this started to, uh, almost two years ago now, when this started, there was a tall fence that was supposed to be between the schools and the collectives and the and the other organizations. Just recently, that fence has been lowered where they're talking now, if you will. A school can promote an NIL deal. They just can't be involved in the arrangements. And which leads us into collectives, but I'll but if you want to if you want to follow up on that a little bit. Okay. Um, so there's two different ways to go about it. The collectives is kind of like a political action committee if you're looking at politics, you know, That's where right. people donate money into it. And then who's ever running that collective decides how much money they're going to distribute to the team members, or do they have to give all team members the same amount of money? That's up to the that's up to the collective, but okay. most but so think of a collective as and this is a ball, it's it's obviously a new concept but it's evolved a lot since its inception about 8 10 12 months ago so mm -hmm. most universities will have one 
or more collectives that the universities now are encouraging their boosters to donate to. Okay. And then all this money comes into this collective and then who's ever running the collective, which is usually often a former athletic administrator or a former athlete at that school. So then they will then say, they'll work with the YMCA or the Salvation Army is one types of entities or they'll work with businesses, but let's go the more the public service route. So then they'll say to the Salvation Army, I can give you all the men's basketball athletes one per Saturday for the next 12 weeks. Great, they're gonna say that's great. And then, and then the collective pays the men's basketball team. Each member may get 15, 20,000. The, the amount of money is phenomenal. And why are they doing these collectives? Because other schools are doing the collectives and you want every member of your man's basketball team to get, you know, we're, we're talking maybe 100,000 a year. We're in football, maybe you're talking 20 at least, um, all through these. now. The money are coming from the boosters. What remains to be seen then is, is that going to impact the university's fundraising that the money goes through the university? And is it going to impact uh, non-revenue sports or maybe some women's sports? If I'm, a, at the, if I'm in Lawrence, Kansas, if I'm the car dealership there, and I've given $10,000 every year for the past few years to the university. That makes me a member of that booster club. And for 10,000, I'll get my name in a program probably. I'll be able to use that we're the University of Kansas sponsor. And that's probably what 10,000 gets me. If I donate to a collective and I'm a member, if my organization is a member of that collective, I can maybe get a couple of men's basketball athletes for two or three Saturdays. Where's the, is that a bigger bang for the buck? I would argue maybe yes, maybe it is. And so then I may not donate to the university anymore. I'm gonna donate to the collective now. So that takes away funds from the university that they can use for anything. Yeah. It's so like infrastructure. That, that's right. So it, all that remains to be seen. Again, we're talking with the collectives. They're only, they're less than a year old. Yeah. Now, last year, there was a kid that played for K-State, and I don't, don't even know his name, but he was, I think he was a sophomore, and he led the team in scoring. He scored like 14 points a game or so. Decided to go into the transfer portal. He did. He ended up transferring to Miami University in Florida got paid $400,000 a year for next two years by an alum. Now, this wasn't a collective. This was just an alum. And this alum now has been doing this. He must be filthy, filthy rich because he's been doing this for not only basketball, but football and paying large sums like that. What type of commitment does the athlete have to that alum for that, that type of money? I mean, that's huge money. Right. The NCAA legislation in this area relating to recruiting is says you cannot basically work a deal with a recruit during the recruiting process because, first of all, a booster is not supposed to have contact with a prospect. So if you're a booster, you know, you can't arrange a deal if he if the person is still a prospect. Okay. And the second thing is that deal is not supposed to be contingent upon your enrollment, okay? So the, the, guy, the athlete you're talking about is Pack, Nigel Pack. And so, so that, that booster at Miami, supposedly then says to Pack, I will, I'm gonna give you 400,000 or whatever, whatever the, I don't know the, the, the specific facts, but whatever the number was, 
to promote my company. What he doesn't say is, if you come to Miami. Now, so I'm a, I want to take it out of that scenario and talk more generally. So an athlete, a prospect, if, he, if that prospect gets approached or his advisor gets approached, which is more likely going to happen, his advisor gets approached and says, we want to give you 200000 to do a couple of appearances for my car dealership. That's fine, okay. But it can be if you come to come to Miami or Lawrence, Kansas. Now, so technically that athlete could say great and then go to K-State or Clemson, you know. But then they probably have a deal in Clemson or K-State, so you, you, know, you wouldn't do that. But technically it can't be based upon your, it can't be contingent upon your enrollment at that school. How do they get around that, Chuck? There's no way in hell that a guy put up 400 grand two years in a row if the kid didn't play for Miami. How do they get around it? It's, yeah, well, again, you go, to the, you go through the advisor. And now who's an advisor? An advisor, a, that's been broadened now where an athlete can have, um, I think it's called a business manager. I, I forgot the term it's either, but it's basically a business manager or financial advisor. Because okay. what's what's the issue here? You've got 18, 19 year olds getting a half a million dollars or more. Now, you know, these are big numbers, but the number of people getting that is very small if you think about the number of athletes in Division One. So, you know, it is astounding. We're getting, that athlete is going to get a million dollars a year. A star quarterback may get a million dollars a year. Unbelievable. But how many get that? Well, if there are thousands within Division I, it's about two or three. So all of this is for a very small population. Most athletes don't get that. So... But how are they getting it? Well, they, they get it through these advisors or managers. And the, the, the situation behind that was, here's this 19-year-old getting a half a million dollars. And they have no concept of that. I, you know, I've got a 20 and a 24, and I don't trust them with 500, let alone 500,000. So all of a sudden you've got, a half a million dollars in your pocket, you know, even even some fat offensive linemen, you know, is because I played defensive linemen. So I, I was a defensive lineman. So yeah, some fat, all offensive linemen are stupid. So so you're going to give some offensive linemen, you know, you're going to give some offensive linemen $2,000. And what are they going to do? They're going to go spend it on food. And you have, <laughs> you have all these athletes getting this money with no knowledge of financial management. That is why most schools now have a special, have an individual, have a department that helps them with financial management. Many of the state laws require a school within that state to provide five hours of financial management to all their athletes. Mm. Okay. All right, so let me put this into the, like a real world situation. Again, I, I talked earlier about my grandsons playing Division One basketball in New York, and you know he's starting as a freshman point guard. He's 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 pretty good. Um, he's got a ways to go, but he's pretty good. He's got a chance of he's got a pretty high ceiling. Okay, as an athlete. But he's got a chance somewhere down the road to get into the transfer portal and also possibly be able to get some NIL money. Mm -hmm. So he's talked to his AAU coach. His AAU coach has made contact with a number of Power Five schools, and there's somebody that's interested. How does, how does he become eligible for NIL money? 
I mean, who, who initiates that? Would the, the AAU coach then go to that school and say, hey, uh, is there somebody in town maybe that would be interested in paying my kid to represent them at their dealership or whatever? Is, is that kind of a scenario that may happen? Again, think of the two buckets. That AAU coach, on, a, for, on an individual basis, that AAU coach can go to the co local car dealership and say, my, my, my athlete is probably going to come here. What type of deal? And if I'm that person, I'm going to say, wait till he comes here, and then, then we'll talk. But um, Or else you go to the collective knowing that you talk to the school about what are what are athletes getting here? A uh, deal's arranged through the collective. I mean, if if you're the top quarterback, and let's say you're one of the four schools in the play football playoff, and you sit down with one of the top football prospects, you can't say if you come to my school, I'm going to guarantee you one million dollars in NIL deals. What you say is. The last three quarterbacks that have come here are have gotten one million. You know what's the saying about in financial planning? Uh, past performance is no indication of future. So whatever that is, and and that's kind of what that's what you say. You know, everybody else has got a million. I can't tell you you're going to get a million, but and so. That's that's how you do that. But with for your grandson, he's either going to have to wait until he gets to the next place if he if he is going to transfer, or as you know, I don't know Mara's situation, but they may have something already established for that for that basketball team. Yeah, now, I hope I hope the audience doesn't misinterpret this whole thing. He loves Maris and he loves playing for him. And, and I, you know, he may graduate from there in four years, just like uh, he had planned to originally. So, you know, I'm just using him as an example. Uh, like I say, he, he loves Maris. He loves the coaching staff. A lot of really good friends he's made on the team and everything. So he's just an example that I'm throwing out there. But there, there are kids like him. You know, well, he's, that, uh, he's got a population. He's in a pool of which 35 to 40 to 50 percent are going to transfer that's yeah. just the reality of it so he has a i would say he has a 50 percent chance of transferring yeah and and again that goes back to the conversation we were having the first session about how difficult it is for a coaching staff mm -hmm. i mean you have a kid there that you know in the past you bring kids along, you develop them, you know, and they were okay as freshmen and sophomore, they were a lot better and junior and senior, they become really good. And you've invested yourself and your staff and your time, you know, playing this kid in order to develop them. Now, all of a sudden you play the kid and he develops and boom, he's gone. You know, he goes to a power five school and, and all that that you've invested in this kid, it wasn't wasted necessarily. Hopefully, it helped you win some games. But for a coach now, it's it's just different. It's going to be a super challenge, I think, for those who are not at the the top. You know, not at the the Kentucky or the KU or or places like that. You have you have more mobility because of the transfer portal. You have more incentive because of the name image and likeness so it's easier to go someplace else and it's more lucrative maybe to go to someplace else so yeah. you know coaches got that you know some coaches that's a disadvantage for other coaches it's an yeah, advantage yeah it's a real advantage now looking at it from the athlete standpoint though and, and this happened this is this has happened since transfers started years and years and years ago you the grass is always greener you know and you transfer to some place and you think ah oh, this is the place that i really want to be and I, and then you get there and you find out it's really not where you want to be i guess you can now go back into the portal the next year 
and go someplace else. But had you stayed at your other school, I mean, you, you have your relationships, not only with the coaching staff, but with the, the administration, your professors, your teammates, you know, which you and I have realized over the years, relationships are what really matter. As long as you have, you know, you go into a job situation, as long as you have enough money to do okay, the relationships are more important. And, and maybe that's what the coach sells now is you've got all these relationships. Do you really want to break these relationships? And I had a situation like that when I was coaching at Benedictine. I had a kid that played for me for three years and he was all conference. Um, and we didn't have a whole lot of all conference players there when I was there, but he was all conference. And after his junior year, he got in trouble doing some stuff, you know, and so I lined up some punishments for him. He did all the punishments, did everything I asked him to. And uh, he comes to me right at the end of the semester, second semester, and says he's going to transfer to another school in our conference, you know, which automatically means he has to sit out a year. And, and I tried to explain to him, so why would you want to do that? And he, he says, well, I just don't think you're going to treat me fairly in the, in the past. And I said, well, I've, or in, in the future. And I said, well, have I treated you fairly in the past? Oh, yeah, coach. Was my your punishment fair? Yeah. Did you finish your punishment? Yes. Why would you want to leave? You know, these are all your friends. You've had three years at our school. You know, all the professors uh, and, and just everything that is good about being in the college environment. And he said, yeah, but I just, I just don't think I'm going to get a fair shake going forward. He transfers, sits out a whole year, goes to that other school, and he had an okay uh, year with them. But as soon as the season was over after that fifth year for him, I get an email from him, and he said he apologized to me. He said he made a huge mistake. He said, I never should have left my friends, my teammates, et cetera. You know, and so and I think maybe that is now what the coach is going to have to do is convince kids that these relationships are more important than – money or fame you know you'll get if you're really good you'll get an opportunity to play at the next level even with us mm -hmm. yeah and remember the the the, the old wows that we're talking about today apply to less than one percent of all ncaa that's divisions one two and three so what you, I agree with everything you just said, and that's still going to apply to the vast majority of NCAA athletes, all divisions, all sports. I'm a big, we do a lot of work with, with Division II schools, and I, I love the Division II experience. I think, I think too many athletes are, are wowed by Division I, and, mm -hmm. and, Division two, we could argue, is more centered on the athlete than Division one, even. And so, I these are significant changes, but these changes are only affecting a very small number of athletes. And even if you take Division one only, you know, it's it's greater than one percent. But I, don't, I would. I haven't seen anything recently. At one point, it was less than ten percent of all Division One athletes are getting NIL deals. But the collective, collective, the collective is going to normalize it, if you will. It's going to get more people involved because of the locker room issue. If you're the quarterback and you're getting a million dollars, and the offensive lineman's not getting anything, if I'm the lineman, I'm going to say, "Hey, wait a minute." what's going on here? You know, I'm going to let this guy go by one time and we'll see how, we'll see a million dollars, you know, we'll see how good you are, you know, and so that's what the collectives are doing. They're making it so more people get it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but again, we're still talking about a small number of athletes overall. Okay. And my last question, then we'll wrap it up. But the last question is, how does this affect high school kids that are coming into college? Can they do an NIL deal before they actually enroll? Or do they have to wait till they enroll and then get an NIL? They can do it. They can, well, first of all, this whole area you have, and the reason the NCAA 
recently hired a new president who's a who's the form a governor is because the NCA saying we need federal legislation in this area. You have state associations have their legislation. You have states themselves have legislation, and then you have the NCAA. The only reason we're here today with the end of the NIL the way it is is because California and a couple other states said we're going to allow athletes to get paid for their name image and likeness if you're a state school if you're if you're UCLA you can't violate state legislation to stay in conformance with NCAA legislation so things were changing the NCAA we have to open this up because the school the states were opening it up therefore but but there's difference within the state associations there's difference within the states so what what your NIL policy is by institution is going to depend a little bit. It's going to depend a lot on what your state has, a little bit about maybe some of your state associations. So when I say, yes, athletes can get deals if they're in high school, that's assuming the high school association allows that. Wow. And it depends what your state. A lot of the states say you can't get a deal while you're in high school. Okay. Okay, so it just varies by state. That's why the NCA said we need uniform, we need national legislation to provide uniformity to this. Okay. Well, Chuck, this has been terrific. The, the education that you provided for us is extremely valuable for a lot of people. And uh, now we, we can actually go out and talk about this and uh, maybe know what we're talking about a little bit. So I really appreciate your time. and. By the time people hear this, legislation could have changed. Something could have changed because this really is it. it we're not going to end where we are now. It's yeah. going in both of these areas. You're going to see more changing, and you're going to see the other legislation that I mentioned catching up with this new change in amateurism. So that that's a great reason to have you come back if you were. You're going to see significant change here over the next over the next year. Okay, well, maybe in the next few months I can get you back on and you can tell us, give us a status update and tell us a few Lee Corso stories. So. Okay, we got we got several of those to tell. All right, Chuck, okay. Very good. Okay. thank you so much. Okay. Thank Great you. Great having you.